Hi guys, before we get started, I want to let you know that I'm publishing a new book. It's called Ruck Me, and it's coming this autumn. If you liked What a Flanker, then you're going to love this. It will be available in hardback, ebook, and audiobook, read by yours truly, of course. If you want to get your hands on a signed copy, then head over to waterstones.com and pre order while stocks last. Thank you for all your support. Now back to your regular programming. Hi everyone, I'm Jace Haskell and welcome to What A Flank of the Podcast Series 2. Today's coach is one of the best coaches I've ever worked with. He's been World Coach of the Year in 2015. He's the only coach who won the major rugby competition in each hemisphere, winning the Heineken Cup with Leinster in 2009 and the Super Rugby competition with New South Wales Waratahs in 2014. Ladies and gentlemen, it's Michael Checker. How are you, sir? Very well, thank you, James. How are you? Well, you're looking very relaxed. I've got to say, very relaxed, reclining in in what looks like the kind of the office. I like it. It is the office, yeah. I, I uh, I've got a lot of books here. I'm not sure if I read any of them, but they're good. They look good. They look good in the background. <laughs> How's lockdown been for you? You've been you've been okay, relaxing, a good refresh. Well, well, like firstly, just from a like a human perspective, it hasn't affected us here in any way, shape or form compared to the effect it's had in Europe. Obviously, we've had some people sick and, and we've unfortunately had some people die, but we've been, I suppose, by our geography a little bit spared the the real difficult times that a lot of people that, you know, around the world have had in the more populous countries. So um, for me personally, it's obviously it's it's had an effect in in a way that it's the first time I've spent time at home ever. I think since I've been going, either playing or coaching, I've never spent this much time at one go in the same country. So, uh, you know, normally it's four or five months away each year. Uh, I think my wife's desperate to get rid of me at this point. She's had me home for too long. But uh, it's been an opportunity to really take some time with my kids and, uh, yeah, like be here, be present. Uh, and I, I, after the World Cup, I was, I suppose I was planning on doing a year of reinvesting in myself, you know, taking some time, doing some different things, getting out of my comfort zone. And obviously once this all happened, it's that sort of extended now for another year, I think, because things have happened during that time that have been really quite interesting, which I've kept going with. And and um, I want to try and use the this or weird situation to to do some different things and get myself out of out of the comfort zone. So it's been obviously a terrible time for a lot of people around the world, but we've been very lucky here in Australia with we, we haven't really been hampered as much and, and hopefully everyone will be back to normal soon. I think there's a lot of wives out there who used to recall begging their husbands to stay, like, I don't want you to go, I don't want you to go now. They're actually packing the bags. You're like, babe, I haven't got nowhere to be. And they're, 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 they're planning things for you, looking at your calendar, going, I think you should probably go and do that job. But you're like, I, I like being at home. Yeah, there's a job in Morocco, I think. There's a third division team uh, in, uh, somewhere out in West Africa or somewhere. You might need to get that gig. But... Uh, I, Chloe keeps saying to me, Chloe, keep, Chloe keeps saying to me, I want you, to, you know, I'd love you to, uh, love you to go travelling. And I was like, no, I'd love we to go travelling. And she went, no, 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 I'd love you just to go travelling. I was like, oh, it's a, bit, it's a bit tight. But what, um, but mentally though, so, so you do, you, do you feel like it's been quite a good thing? Because I know you're, you're very right in saying that context is is so important with these things, and obviously, that's why social media and the media at the, at the moment is so sort of, you know, all or nothing. It's because people don't have context. For some people, you know, COVID's probably been one of the most tragic affairs that's ever happened. But for other people, it's actually been quite a nice reset. Um, so have you been able to sort of, like, cherry pick the, the bits you wanted to do? Because I know I've seen yeah. here that you're doing stuff yeah, around the I, in, in Sydney. I, last year, I was really, I've good friends with Trent Robinson, who's the coach of the Roosters. And last year, I, well, last season, I had a long stint. All the pre-season, I went over the World Cup Challenge. Um, and then... Uh, and then into the sea. They had when the lockdown really came. They had to go into a bubble, which I couldn't go in initially. But then went in it for the back half of the year, just before the Tri Nations for three or four months, and it was a great experience. So uh, you know, just it being a totally different game. Well, obviously I know that game from growing up with it. 
but just seeing how it works, the difference between league and union, the understanding the applicable skills from league that could be brought to rugby, um, knowing, like seeing it as a rugby coach being there as opposed to a league coach coming across to rugby and you seeing how we could use those and just a different set of guys. And, but mate, that's the first time I've ever been in a coaching environment where I haven't been the head coach. Just that in itself, right? So that, that was there. And then same with Argentina, like not being the head coach, it was a, just a totally different experience. And uh, uh, it, it was really good to see it from a different perspective. And um, like learnt, I've done a lot of things over this last, uh, I don't know, 18 months, however long it's been, that I would never really have expected to be doing. You know, that's, that's led now to me going to be coaching Lebanon at the Rugby League World Cup in 2021. Hopefully it goes ahead over there. You guys are, you know, getting the, the vaccinations happening fast, so hopefully it's going to go ahead, which would be unbelievable experience, you know, for me. So I really have, I haven't planned it, but I, I planned it. I planned to, I wanted to be reflective. I wanted to go and run a rule over myself. About 20 years I've been going coaching in a row. No, no break ever, and I just wanted to take the time. Obviously, obviously, after not achieving a goal that I wanted to achieve, to run the rule over myself and see how I can get better. I'm fascinated by um, the fact. Obviously, you know, I want to talk a little bit about the, the league stuff. But what, you say obviously not being being head coach. Was it kind of one of the things I want to talk about? And, and this has been a common theme with kind of when I talked to Eddie Jones, I talked to Warren Gatland. Was Coaching, most people think coaching is about coaching, but when you're a head coach, it's probably only 15%, if that, of what you actually have to do. Was it quite nice just to go in there and, and actually fall in love with doing what you do best, which is w- working with the lads and not actually having to have all the pressure on your shoulders? Yeah, uh, it was it was different, you know. I'm, I think you, you're spot on with what you're saying about that. That's like, you know, the difference between leading and managing, you know. The, the leadership that goes on as the head coach is... Is you know you can be taken so many different ways, and it's a big part of what you do, as well as some of the more you know business, the business oriented side of the of rugby, and then the managing is the coaching. You know, just getting the technical work or the tactical work done, the on field. And I think the role I was able to play was a sort of a hybrid between the both. You know, I was able to when needed by the coaches that I was working with, apply some of my head coaching skills and then also just be um, there working with the guys in a specific arena around what that coach wanted me to bring to the team. So it was it was good. It was very different and I felt, but I still felt really valuable um, in the roles. So just... I, it was just different, you know, and I wanted to. I I, I felt like I, I didn't plan it that way. It just felt like it was something that was really good for me when it started happening. Most uh, league coaches come over to Union. Union's full of ex-league coaches who sort of, you know, they brought us the blitz defence. They talk about running lines, but you've obviously said going the other way. What kind of things did you feel that kind of Union could just as a bit of a geeky question? What what Union could could, could give to league because it doesn't ever seem to happen that way. Well, one of the one of the big things I think is um, around, so if you think about it, rugby union is like one big game of goal line rugby league. So that's the only time a defence is right up at the play the ball, at the ruck. So the handling skills that go on in rugby, they're always a lot closer to the defensive line. And, and I think that whole idea of, you know, when to use what passing, how to... Uh, the lines you you run, which when the the defence is a lot closer, and you don't have um, as much time, because obviously a lot of league coaches will want to take the ball much close, lot much deeper into the line to get the better outcomes. So there's a lot of those those types of skills that are transferable. You know the different types of passing. A lot of it's around the attacking side of the game, without a doubt. The kicking side of the game as well, and the Chasing and then the overall tactical scheme. So, the like any game, uh, it gets led down a certain direction by by some successful teams or successful coaches. Everyone starts doing that same thing because it works, and then you want to get different eyes on it. How do you see 
the game. In fact, there was a game on the um, which was played by I think Cronulla Sharks here round one of the weekend, where they pulled a move straight out of the rugby ranks off a of scrum. So the eight to nine because they've changed the rules in league this year, so the back rowers can't get off it defensively. Eight nine hit the guy, hit the next, the 12, they put, pulled the little ball out the back and then shifted it to the edge. They scored off first phase off a scrum, which is rarely seen in rugby league. You know, that, that move's coming straight out of a rugby playbook. They're the things, Kevin, yes, there's not as many transferable features because the, the contact work and the running line and the tackle and, and all of that is very, you know, much a rugby league trait. But there's still a lot of things... In, in particular, in looking at how to change the game of league a little bit more as opposed to playing it the same way. I mean, that's, that's fascinating. I want to know what, what happened with Argentina as well, because I... Uh, there's so much I want to talk to you about. And I, want, I do want to go back to the beginning, but um, obviously the reason we kind of you know reconnected is, is it's it's anyone who's read my book knows that I'm a massive fan of yours. Our time in Stade Francais, which let's be honest, was a very odd time, and I, you know in terms of some of the craziest stuff going on. I mean, I had three coaches in, in one season one year, um, but we can we can come on to that. But but I remember turning on the TV to watch Argentina versus the All Blacks, and I thought. I recognise that bloke sitting in the coaching box. And obviously, I, because I'm not a real sort of rugby keynote, it kind of gone under my radar. Well, that well you obviously, Mario, how, how did that happen? What was that experience from like? He, I, he came up to start from say and, co- uh, and coach there with me. And then he, uh, he, he came to New South Wales and Australia with me um, after the, the 15 World Cup. And was with us till two end of two seventeen, and was a very instrumental part of of um, of what we done. Maybe two eighteen, I can't. We had two seventeen, so extremely important. We were very close, you know, like we're very close friends. And I I was in Europe in March, maybe February of two thousand twenty. They were over there, you know, doing a bit of work, look meeting players, and what watching Six Nations. It was on at that time, and. Uh, he, we just started talking about it and he asked me, and I, to be honest, I would have thought, I, I wasn't really thinking about ever, you know, being in that situation of having to coach against Australia. So I I just, we just sort of said, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, didn't, I thought I'd be doing something else by that stage, you know what I mean? And because of the situation, we kept talking and talking and they're really, really high quality people, you know, that his team of coaches... Him, I've always had a very um, strong association to the Argentinian players from coaching Felipe Contempomi, Rodrigo Roncero, you know, I'm friends with Gus Pichot. Uh, they're, they're, I've, even from playing days, you know, when I was playing back in Italy and in France, uh, back in the uh, amateur era, there was, uh, there was always Argies over there and they were always good fun. They always, I don't know, always connected with them strong, in a strong way. So... They were the guys that really sort of pushed for me to go to Stade Francais after I had the time at Leinster. So it was. It just feels very quite natural to me to be in their environment, and it's very different. And the the guys they had on this tour were, were bloody amazing. They were. They'd been in so many quarantines over the time, of, and they'd all they had such an up and down ride, even just to get here. And they were in a very hard quarantine when they got here, and so. Once we got together, I think the first place we stayed at was at Manly. Uh, and, of course, my, Michael was talking before, my missus was keen as custard to get me out of the house, so even though I only lived half an hour away. I was staying in the hotel. The, they, I think they were a bit scared to leave the hotel at first. You know, they weren't sure what they were allowed to do what they because they'd been in so many lockdowns. And there was such a sh- really strong team spirit and it was a really good experience for me. It was, a, it was very different, very different to some of the coaching I've been involved with before. And I really enjoyed it, had a great time. Obviously, with good people, it helps, you know. Yeah, I mean, I look, I, we obviously had a lot of our, um, Argentinians at, at Stan Francais. You know, they're some of the best people. I, I mean, never get caught out on a night out with them because they start at about two in the morning. Uh, just as you're going to bed, they, they're going out. Um, but they were incredible. Like, you know, Rodrigo was unbelievable, you know, um, well, Juan Leguizamo, obviously yeah. our time in Stad. Yeah, you're right. I mean, the Argentinians are, are are brilliant. I wish I'd done some, had the opportunity to go on the Barbarians with some of them because yes. I think, I mean, I might never have come back. No, there's a good chance that would have happened, especially if the game was down there in Argentina. Definitely. Yeah, I mean, I, 
I never forget. I was I, I played in Salter once with England, England, and I remember I walked into this what looked like a sushi restaurant, and I took the wrong door going to the bathroom, and it, it walked into this nightclub with this big. It was like this big white bubble room, and everyone was just going for it, and I was like, "Oh my god!" If I walked through Narnia, like the white line, the witch in the wardrobe. Well, um, I have a, I have a, a real issue with you that being an accident, James. I think that may have been part of the coach. <laughs> yeah, I accidentally walked into this nightclub, got home at seven o'clock in the morning of a game. Sorry. <laughs> you, sound, you sound like every coach I've ever had. I remember I used to have die. I mean, with you, I used to come and you'd be like, James, what the fuck have you been doing, right? Die Young, die young would go, James, I need to see you in the uh, I need to see in the office. And I go in there and I'd be like, what happened? He goes, you know what you fucking done? I said, I, it wasn't me. And he goes, you, it was you. It was you. <laughs> Before I'd even told me what I'd done. Um, what, what, what were you doing with Argentina? What was your kind of role? Oh, mate, it was, it was a very specific role called a bit of everything. All right, so... The, you know, whatever Mario wanted, needed, you know, attack. I uh, did a lot of tackling work, like a lot of stuff that I got, I, I learned from Lee, tried to apply it straight away. Um, and we did some really interesting things in, in the tackle contest. Uh, just, you know, buddied up to a few players, did all types of stuff, you know, worked with the coaches, all types of things, you know. So whatever he, whatever... Mario really needed that. They had a lot of coaches there because they had the big group. So there was like 40 something players. So they had plenty of coaches and just a different voice. And, um, you know, obviously I had some local knowledge as well from being around the boat, the other two teams, fair, a fair while. So, um, and yeah, I actually had to play a very different role because I was probably the more understated, um, you know, sort of calm. Cool, you know, a bit more. That was the role I had to play there inside that environment, so which I really enjoyed, actually. Sorry, you were you were calm. Yeah. I don't. Yeah. I mean, what? How? What do they have? They have a high powered rifle on you yeah. at some some point. <laughs> but it's all. About, were you tranquilized? You've got to understand when there's a lot of other activity around. You got to you got to know the role you're playing, and when you're not when you're not in charge, you have to fill the role that others. That you may you may Neil, no needs to be filled as opposed to just doing what you want to do because you're the boss. You see, I love that, and that, that's such one of the things le- later on I want to come to about that kind of thing because because your kind of personality is synonymous with kind of on you wear your heart on your sleeve, you're passionate, you're vocal, you're you're always front of house. But I, I think it's amazing to hear that you kind of you know that you actually enjoyed those bits where kind of you were able to assume the um, assume the role, which is which is great. What was that? What was that win like with Argentina? Because obviously. I imagine, you know, when you were coaching Australia, wins were great when you were head coach. But to, to beat New Zealand like they did, to have that kind of moment, was it, did it mean everything to you as well? Were you blown away by the emotion? Uh, I was just extremely happy for the players and the coaches, you know, that they got the... There's, there's a few moments, right, that happen in, a, in the career of coaching or playing or whatever you're doing where there's really... Uh, that unbridled joy, like the belief that you've just done something that you never thought you could do, right? They might happen only a few times because once you've done them, they'll never happen again. So that, you, that was one of those moments, you know, where you t- and what I often do there is I sort of draw back, sit back and, and watch, you know what I mean? And uh, it was a pretty crazy day too because we were playing at a neutral ground. We're in Australia, number one. So there wasn't that many people at the ground, but it sounded like by the time the game finished, it sounded like there was 100,000 Argentinians there. You know, they'd all gone from around the stadium all to one corner. They'd gravitated to one corner of the ground. And it was just it was just amazing, you know, and that it, as, as far as atmospheres goes. And things went our, things went our way in a, in a, in a, in a, weird sort of way because you didn't make many errors at all with the ball in hand and that comes from having a real clear focus there wasn't a lot of head noise there was a lot of the lead up to the week leading up to it was really interesting for me to see how that evolved you know and what the that's the first time I've ever been in the behind the scenes of another country's team so I was like just like watching very interestingly and whenever I was asked to participate in that, trying to make it as genuine as possible. But 
I think it's those moments where you just sit back and watch your mates, you know, enjoy themselves, you know. Take it. Take... Did it feel magical? Did it? Did Did you feel like it was going to be a magical week? Or was it just a normal I did. preparation? I, I, I did. I think well, I go into a lot of I've got a very positive attitude around stuff, you know, around every game, every week. Um, and because it was fresh and new, I, I felt, yeah, I, I'm, I think that often when I've obviously been involved in a lot of turnaround teams and, you know, teams that are trying to do things where they're not expected to do so over, over my time. And so the element of surprise sometimes can be a real weapon. Um, and I felt like that week, obviously in New Zealand, there are high quality outfit right uh and have been for the last 10 years 10 more years you know but they there was always going to be an element of surprise that argentina could deliver on that day it's a one-off moment first game hadn't seen them play for so long so there wasn't a lot of vision no lot lack of preparation so we really tried to use that as a as a weapon in the lead up to the game I love that. I think, I mean, I, I would have loved to have been a sort of a fly on the wall because I think that you're right. There's, there's some moments in, in someone's rugby career, which I hope the guy savoured. I mean, I, I, probably the hardest job you had was trying to probably get him out back in from the night out, I would have imagined after that. Well, no, it was actually really quite, uh, I think there was a real desire to stay together, you know, and just hang at the hotel. It was, it was pretty, they were very happy, obviously. They were still pretty chilled and, yeah, and we're, you know, obviously we have to think about trying to get back onto it the next week straight away. Like, keep that. They had to play four test matches in a row, you know, two two against New Zealand, two against Australia, four, in a, you know, that's the top quality oppositions. And they were able to get a draw against Australia the next week. Got, got it, fell apart a little bit the last 10 or 15 against New Zealand, and then was able to get together for another draw at the end of the tournament. So, you know, and they won the two warm-up games against Australia A as well. So they had, had a great tour considering the, you know, some of the adversity that was put in front of them. And uh, they, they should have been, they deserved to enjoy it, which they did on the last night, I would say that. They definitely did on the last night, yeah. Can I, can I cast your mind back to, to a young Michael Checker? What, what, what were you like as a, as a young person? Did you want to be a rugby player? Were you into all sports? Yeah, all, all sport. You know, we obviously live by the beach, so surf boat rowing, um, surfing when you could, rugby, cricket, rugby league, like we're all brought up on both codes. Uh, you name it, there was, there was something happening, you know, around our area. And I went to a rugby league school, so was brought up playing league. And the Rugby, we could play on the weekends, so we were in some teams that we played in on the weekends, but we were more league players. And I always lived just um, just very close to where Ramwick, the club team here in Australia, played. And I'd always go and watch. And, and in fact, my brother, who went to the same school as me but left just as I came in, they, they had a principal that made them play rugby union. So they, they played union at school. So he was playing for Ramwick. And so... By the time I got to um, leaving school and everything and I needed to decide which game I was going to play, I, I took the uh, very scientific approach of saying, you know, I reckon I could probably get a free trip overseas if I play rugby. That's general. That, mate, we were pretty working class. I'm not going to say we were poor in the street, but we were pretty working class. It's not like we were flying around everywhere, you know. So uh, I generally thought, Right, oh, yeah, I'll get, I'll get a free trip overseas and I could always go back and play a league and and that's how what happened in the end very early on. And I, I never was one, I just loved the the game, the the contest, the the contact, the, yeah, I, I think that was a huge um, part of what I liked about the game. And I'm not quite sure if I was a good player or not, but the, I love that whole physical part of the physical battle in the game. So I really enjoyed it. Yeah. Were you just running around bashing people? No, I'm Was that like what you're trying to say? Games. That's not at all what I'm like. Though. I think <laughs> yeah. what? that you've got to be, in, just on that, part of the, it's very symmetrical, that, that part of the game. I think you've got to be able, 
you've got to be tough and you've got to be hard, right? So hard is, yeah, I'm going around bashing blokes or put shots on them or whatever. But tough is you've also got to be able to cop it, right? When you get hit, where you've got to say, okay, kudos, I'm getting up now and I'm coming back for you, you know? And all just in, in the nature of the game, hard tackling, hard rucking, you know, running hard, you know, trying to get away from guys, putting shots on people. That was, I really, you know, the, the wrestle in a, in a mall or whatever it was, I really enjoyed that part of it, you know. And also, we played in a very running style team, so I got to play on the wing a lot as well, just quietly, hanging out there and running off the backs. But it was, uh, it was, it was really um, good fun, you know. You, you are definitely a frustrated back. And do you know how I know that? Because every single training session when there's unopposed, who should appear as the number 10 for the for the opposition, the, t- the bin juice? Oh, is that Michael Checker playing at 10? You always push the young 10 out, dummies. And any time that anyone drops the ball, it was their fault. Any time you dropped the ball, it was a shit pass. I've never seen anything like it. Listen, I, I'd, uh, you'd have to go far and wide to find someone who's played 5-8 for Leinster, Randwick, Start from say <laughs> Australia, New South Wales, Barbas. I've played ten for a lot of teams. I have honestly, they are some of my best memories of when you're standing up, getting the ball, run off me, and you throw a pass. It was shit pass. You'd be like, "Fuck's sake, you're not reading me, you dickhead!" And I'm like, "Oh my god, how is he getting away with this?" And then, and then the best thing is, it's a bit like if you had a hat with like boss on it, like a bit like there's a character over here, Alan Partridge. I don't know, but when you make shit jokes, you just got boss. Someone, someone's about to answer back, and go fuck you, just like that. Who's the head coach? Shut the fuck up. No one ever said anything back. These little French kids. I remember it was some of the best thing I've ever seen. When I, when I went to, uh, when I coached at Leinster, I, I was still like, I was probably only mid, late thirties when I started. So I was doing everything, like jumping in the contact skill drills and everything. And of course the poor fellas there, they, they didn't know what to do because they probably only had school teachers before and or whatever, whistling them around. But, uh, and they didn't know whether to hit me or do, what to do. And then until I finally said the stupid thing of what, like, I'm, what do I get a free ticket here? And then he slipped, I think, one of the young bucks, Paul asked me. And then that was it. I was, every time I jumped in there, it was get him more than you want to get anybody else. It's like he broke the mold and that was it. I remember as well, though, because you love that the old leaguey carry. I, I remember when we do unopposed, and I'd see you coming up the line, but like, oh, checks is my man. I'd come up, and just at the end, I'd just get a little elbow, a little bump, and, but, and then you'd run off. And I'd be like, oh, I was, shouldn't, why was I being nice to him? It was too much respect going on. Um, do you remember after that session as well? I've got, I made this in my notes. That session, we were at that, you know, at Stad, we ended up training all over the place. I remember you coming up to me going, Hess, mate, you, want, you know, you think you can fucking tackle. Why don't you fucking tackle me? And I was like, what? You know, I was doing extra tackle. You made me tackle you like 10 times. And I think, I think the first one, I think you actually bumped me off. And you were like, and then you were like, then you went into coaching mode and you were like, nah, mate, come on. And I was like, hey, by the end of it, you're like, I'd hear you go, Ugh! and you get back up. You didn't want to show, you didn't want to show any weakness. And by the end of it, I'd got a dead shoulder. You were limping and that was it. And that was a, se- that was a session over. Sometimes I it's love just to prove a point, you know, bonding. That's yeah. the way coaches can bond sometimes with players. Uh, who did you, who, when you were younger, who did you uh, want to emulate? Obviously, league or legal union. Who you, who did you run around pretending to be? Uh, well, in league, definitely like uh, Arthur Beetson, who you guys probably don't remember, but he's one of the great players here. Is he was one of the first big men who could offload and uh, had ball ball skill. Like started, you know, driving that um, sort of uh, way of playing. And I think that he was he was a part of it. And then uh, in rugby, I, I suppose I didn't look at it as much, but when I would watch Randwick, guy I ended up having to compete with for position, a guy called John Maxwell, like he was like got to be the toughest, hardest footballer I think I've ever seen in either code. And... and yeah, I had to compete with him for position. He was in my position, but I used to go and watch that. He played like 400 and some games for Randwick in the end and coached me there as well. Uh, tough, like just uncompromising. Yeah, and I like the idea of being able to flick between both of those modes 
creative mode. Um, you know, I can still be big and tough, but I've still got some skills and I and can create. Uh, and I can play tough or I can play free flowing as well, or I can play a bit fancy, not just be pigeonholed in that that one box, which Arthur Beetson, who, who pretty much he led, I think, so when all the state of origin started, he was the real talismanic Queensland guy. I played for the Roosters here, um, you know, as a as a, one of the icons here and uh, like serious player, I loved him. Because that was one of the things you I talk about in my, in my book, actually. I remember when we started working, I remember you taking me to one side and we're like, look, I see work on your skills, but one thing I think you need to focus on is kind of those those one-on-one battles and that ability to switch between those those modes and to, to really impose yourself physically but be able to take it and I, and I you know and, and that's something that I worked quite heavily on you know whether I was not one-on-one necessarily with my competition but you know making sure that I was you know the standout back row doing what I was doing but also if I ever got into physical confrontation with someone was to, to never back down and, I, and, I, and actually it, it, it kind of changed the way I, I, I approach things because I think probably I was physical but I probably didn't quite have that switch that you're talking about between being constantly, you know, constantly on. And um, there's a great story when I remember we, we played Toulouse away. And basically, I remember you saying to me before kickoff, you said, listen, I want you to get into to De Sautoir. And I was like, fine. You know, and I, and I remember all game, every time I went to clear him out, I'd land on top of him. I knew him to get me up. I'd do everything. But I razzed him up so much that on one side of one wall, he elbow, honestly, he went to elbow me and would have taken my head completely off and I and, and there's a split second I was like oh my god Michael Checkers is actually gonna get me killed and I managed to see it bizarrely because I've got the reactions of a snail and it went whistling over whistling over his head and I thought oh my god but I enjoy, I, enjoy, I but I, for me that was a win I was like do you know what this is exactly what you told me would happen if I got under his skin it put him off his off his game so it's interesting to see where you kind of got that that mentality from I mean were you like that as a player uh, yes definitely like the I think the it's that whole balance of just being able to, and different players are different. I'm not saying, obviously, you know, there's, there's a, most players aren't going to be like that. But when you've got a certain, that that was my sort of role in the team. I was that player could niggle to a point where, you know, it was annoying. And then if it had to blow up, it blew up. If not, you get on with business and got to, I think it's always about being able to take it there. You know, I think what well, I was taught by some of the uh, guys who have sat in this exact box here, Eddie Jones, would I played with a lot at Ramwick, uh, and that whole crew when they were a little bit older than me. So when I came into the team, uh, you know, they had really had that attitude of that no one was sort of like Campo. He would get dr- grilled at training. You know, like cream, any mistakes, every there was this real sense of. Um, being able to niggle your own teammates and niggle each other so that you got used to it and that you were used to the barrage that would come from the opposition as well when, when it would be on. And it was just one tactic in, you know, a, a whole can of tactics that you'd carry into a game, whether they were both, whether they were technical or whether they were mental. I think obviously that, that art form's slowly but surely being lost a little bit because it's hard to do anything on, on a footy field anymore. Like even hear the refs telling players not to talk to each other anymore, you know what I mean? Or, or, or give someone a, a, a sledge or a, you know, something like that, in, you know, or muck around stuff. But look, it was, it, it was I think that idea of being able to, I, I, I suppose I'll wrap it up like this. When you walk on the, when you walk inside the four white lines, that's, you become that, person you're, you're the you're the rugby player it's not it's not who you are off the field uh it's that's what you do for your team is what's on there you cross the white line you want to contest everything and in rugby one of the big things is every every ball is a contest every play is a contest that's a big differential between the two games and you've got to contest for everything every ruck you've got to try and stop someone from getting in there or you've got to get the ball Every line out, every everything's a contest, and if you don't contest all the time, I think you're ceding some space in the game to your opponent. And you know I, I, that's how I always believed it. And sometimes it wasn't good enough technically to 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 not give ground. So you've got to use other other mechanism, other tools. 
No, but that's what exactly what you said to me. You know, and that, I felt that was kind of the missing element. I think it was because, like you said, it, it, it's not it's not taught. You've either got you got either got the ability to do it or not. And I remember you saying that every single thing you get involved with is a challenge between you and the opposition. Um, and it kind of transformed me because I was always I was physical on the field, but that ability to when I crossed the line to switch into that mode, it made me a better better competitor. And then obviously I developed the game. So it was really interesting because some you know some coaches had probably. When you get into age group coaches, they talk about that violence, they talk about that physicality, but it's kind of sometimes it's lip service because you look at them and think, "What the fuck? Who are you going to fight? Like, what are you going to do?" You know. But then when I think someone like you spoke about it, because you, you know your demeanor, like you're you're very much a a do as I say, do as I do kind of bloke. Where you get other other coaches, you sort of say it, and it, it doesn't really ring true. And that re it really transformed how I how I played amongst uh, amongst other things. So, uh, and it's interesting to see where you kind of. Where you got that from? I'm interested. What what what? You know, we played 300 games for for Randwick. What, what was it like playing with Eddie? You got good memories of Eddie? Was yeah. he? A, you know, because there's a great picture of him punching someone, uh, or, or there's some old black and white photo with Eddie's like rearing up. But obviously, he wasn't the tallest guy in the world. So, I, was he a bit of a nightmare? No, he was. He, first of all, he was good. He was good rugby IQ. Like he knew the game out and out, and uh, he was he was small. So to play in that position. Think about the front row now and the types of players who are playing hooker now, and think about um, Eddie and how he played there. And he was also like he was one of those guys who could he could dish it out, but he knew how to take it as well. He wouldn't accept it, right? You know, he wouldn't accept it. But he was he was tough. He was tough, smart footy player. He was always going to be a good coach. There's no doubt about that. That was pretty clear from the start, you know, and. He he wanted to win. He was competitor, so uh, that was a good grounding for me. There, and that team was full of guys like that, you know. So there was a lot of players there that I got to mix with. I, uh, and and I suppose some of the things that happened around him in international footy, where Kearns came in and came from second grade to play around week to play hooker for Australia, and you know gave him a you know, a real. Uh, even more of a chip on his shoulder to prove himself, you know, which he's done as a player, obviously, and as a coach as well. So uh, that that type of adversity makes you who you, who you are, you know. I think that he he came across and and he was a, he was a good touch footy player, good touch footy commentator as well. He was the head lead commentator in all the touch footy games before training. Uh, so, but it was good fun, you know. We had good times, good fun. Do you think that um, that period shaped you um, as a coach? So now you look back and think what your influences were to turn you into a coach. Did, did those kind of things shape you? I mean, what 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 made you the kind of guy you are? Well, I think from oh, I never thought about coaching ever. Right, uh, the the coaching happened for me pretty much the same way playing happened for me in rugby. At the end of I was still playing in '99, and Campo came training. David Campisi came training one day, and he said. Oh, mate, and my team in Italy is looking for a coach, part of us, you, you into it? Or what you, and I thought, oh, sounds like a good holiday, you know. Oh, that's generally what I thought. And I thought, I'll try it. I'll do it in another language. I spoke Italian from playing over there. And if I like it, I'll see what happens. So, but, so I never really thought about formation of coaching, but if I reflect back, the, the influence that I got through Ramwick through coaches was about identity, like this is the how our team plays and this is how we, uh, the history of our team and this is how we should play all the time. And then from the players that I played with, all, all the top players, Eddie, uh, David Knox, uh, Simon Poitivan, Lloyd Walker, John Maxwell, like multitude, the Ella brothers, like a heap of guys, you know, Mick Murray, uh, Kernsey, all these guys, that showed me about that little bit of edge that's needed all the time, you know, to, to keep pushing the boundaries, keep to keep getting better, like keep improving and keep getting better and being able to, you know, like I said, have a symmetrical thought process around, you know, being tough and it's a tough game, but also being able to take it when you're, you know, that and get back up and get back into it. So it was a really good education uh, for me around 
uh, getting ready for developing my own philosophy around coaching. Yeah, that's what I wondered. H- have you developed that f- philosophy now? Because I think like with the rugby and like the coaching, you sort of went and did it because it sounded like you wanted a free holiday on both of them. And then and then obviously you got into it, found you were good at it. Do you almost, like you said at the start, put a rule over yourself and go, actually, what what am I doing here? What do I want to be known as? Did that, did that ever happen or has it just happened sort of organically? No, I think I was always pretty clear about who I am and what the type of 40 I, how I wanted to approach getting to, to, to how I wanted the team to play footy. A lot of it too is about who you are as, as a person. Like I'm pretty straightforward and direct. Like I do understand that you've got to, you know, put some picture messages in a different picture because people have different um, personalities and identifying those personalities is really important. But no matter what it is, I like the idea that I can blow up at a player on the training part and then go off and work with that same player for 20 minutes after training on that skill, you know, and take care of them after that, uh, you know, when the session's done. So that you, it's almost the pleasure and pain of, of the game, which you, you see all the time and you're practising it. But uh, I just think I had a really clear idea of what I think makes good teams, you know, and how to, how to lead good teams. And uh, doesn't always work, but for me, I found more often than not it has. And it, they're, they're pretty, it's a pretty simple philosophy that I've always tried to live by myself as well. It's usually what makes good people as well. Um, one thing I wanted to ask you was, Eddie um, has talked to me about it and, and, and talked before on kind of record. Growing up as kind of a, a Japanese uh, heritage guy in Australia, obviously Australia can be a bit uncompromising in certain aspects. You know, you, you obviously got Lebanese um, uh, ancestral heritage. We, you know, we talked about it before. You've got a mega scar on your head that you got in a, in a game where someone wasn't, I mean, you know, I, I let you tell the story if you want to, but it did, did that kind of shape your, 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 your toughness? Were you welcomed because, or, or were, did you get a lot of heat from, for being, you know, perceived as foreign? Yeah, I think there wasn't a lot of, there wasn't a lot of immigrant kids playing rugby union. That's for sure. Back then when we were, uh, so always had the outsider perspective, you know, even when, I was, a, a, you know, asked to coach Australia. The, the ultimate, the pinnacle is I still felt like I was an outsider from the establishment. I suppose it's hard to drop those feelings sometimes, you know. Uh, but I, that no one, it's not like anyone forced me to play, you know. I played because I loved it. I didn't care about any of that other stuff. There's plenty of incidents that happened at games and stuff back then, but... It's what I know is this made it. It's certainly not uh, a reflection of of the society. I think it's just the way some people react, you know. And what it's only about what you don't know. And and then if I came with a very uncompromising style of game as well, that adds another layer to it, you know. So I think those. I think all that stuff really helped me to be. Better, tougher, like more more ready for challenges in the future. And I never would never. I, I know I was there, but I never complain about it because no one forced me to play. I chose to play, and I loved playing. You know, and uh, and I know times have changed around all that stuff, but uh, a little bit. But you got to get through the tough stuff, and and you got to enjoy doing it. It's like. There's a lot of people in a lot worse situations than we'll ever be in, right? So if that's the hardest thing you've got to go through, I'll bring it on. Do you think um, part of why teams are successful underneath you is almost that uh, mob mentality, that you're the leader and you're basically uniting them against a co- like a common enemy? Do you know what I mean? Because like, one of the things I, I said uh, in, this, in this kind of interview was that when you spoke about like going over the top, and I'd see you go out in the media and you, you know, fucking putting them on notice and you'd be like rowing with it, you know, and I'll never forget in that final, <laughs> you lobbed that cameraman down the stairs and like, because you're like, you're wearing emotion. And it's, I know so much stuff is considered, you know, like with, 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 with Eddie, you know, he goes out there and basically says what he's going to say to deflect all the attention onto him. He becomes the enemy 
and then we're able to get on with our job. Do you think when, you, when you've when you done that the best is when you've got the best out of your teams, when they're all united and you're kind of the... Because as a player, if I saw you doing it, giving it out, I'm like, fucking hell, the boss is get, get doing it. We, we need to do it. Yeah, look, the, I, I remember a game once in South Africa we were playing. I was with the Tars and could have been in the first year. But, you know, they, they had no self-belief, you know, as a team. But I remember we were actually playing okay. We are getting drilled. We had such, you know, it's a few bad calls and, and it was going, and I saw everyone drop, you know, and I know I'm not allowed, but I came down from the, the thing, I stood on the sideline right in front of the subs on purpose because I want to send the signal to them, you've got to go on there and save the situation, like getting all types of trouble afterwards, you know, but I, I think that, yeah, that you've got, you can do that sometimes and you've got to rally the troops sometimes and sometimes you just got to let it, you got to let it go. you got to build up. And I think it was one of the big reasons why at a, at a certain point I, after those five years, I decided to leave Leinster because I felt like they needed a different type of personality to take them to the next level because there was a lot of pulling and yanking and tearing guys apart in that place everywhere. Unbelievable club, you know, so grateful and so happy that they've continued to be successful but i felt like yeah i think they've probably had enough of me doing it that way it might be time for another personality and of course joe schmidt showed that you know exactly he had totally different uh, personality and took them on to you know, great success so i just think that's that, that's it and you, and you but then you've got to play it other ways in other times you know what i mean there's i think uh in the 15 world cup played it very differently you know, we, we we played a really under the radar, undercover style, you know, case hurrah, hurrah, whatever happens, happens, you know, we're ready to go type approach. Externally, internally, we felt that we, we were, were a lot different and, and it, you know, it gets you on, gets momentum for you and that can happen in, you know, in, in games. And you focus on that a lot when you're with teams that aren't expected to win. You know, so that's when you focus on that a lot. But in that 2015, I, I, you know, you obviously won um, coach of the coach of the year. You know, and I know it was a difficult time because you'd lost a World Cup final. Actually, I was talking to Alex Payne, my kind of my co-host on the Good, the Bad, and Rugby. He's he's a huge fan of you, and he said he saw you just after that that final, and you'd lot, you know, and obviously it's it's someone going, look, here's the ultimate prize that you haven't won. Oh, but by the way, you've won coach of the year, and and you know, when you're when you're an emotional guy, it's a bit like well. You know, we're in the business of winning here, and getting a little accolades on the side isn't it? Is not what it's about. What do you, do you feel that was your best ever coaching year? Do you feel like you got the recipe right, or was it like you said? Because it sounded like it was a bit different than you normally were. Uh, well, we had a big, we had a good build up. You know, good build up. We we were able to do. You know, I pretty much was able to do whatever I wanted around the build up, and. Uh, was able to get back a couple of key players in Gitto and Drew Mitchell and guys who have experience. And we had a had some experience in the team who understood what we wanted to do. And it was that quick turnaround phase from 14 where they'd had a few problems, etc. I wouldn't say it was the best, you know, coaching. It was just different, you know what I mean? It was, we, we played a different card, played a different style, because a different... When I say different style, not on the field, played a different sort of mental style, but played it a different way because of, I think pretty much because of the group we were in. When you were in the group with the team at home and in a you know, way, there was a tough group. So there was a certain way of, of playing. And then when you go to any tournament, you've got to look at how it sits up, you draw, all those types of things. And you've got to, you've got to have, assess your risk appetite make some calls on, you know, how we're going to do this. Even the way we selected the team, like we, we went without a third halfback. We went without a third hooker, if I'm not wrong. Um, we we took a couple of calculated risks early on for because we knew we had that. The, the Uruguay game was second cab off the rank and then we were going into the big, the, we had Fiji, Uruguay. So we took some calculated selection risks and they, they paid off for us. So, um, yeah, I, I wouldn't say it was the best. It just was on the big stage, obviously. And we did a few things that we, were un, we, weren't, we weren't expected to do. So, um, 
you know, that that's probably why it stood out and we'd come back from a from a long way. But it was a good it was good fun. It was a good tournament. Enjoyed it. It look that's one thing I was gonna say, it looked fun. Listening to um and seeing from the outside, it looked like you'd done you united the guys against the cause because obviously they'd had those problems, so they probably felt a bit like all over the place because no one gave them any chance of getting to that that World Cup final. Do you know what I mean? I, I mean that's what I remember at the time. Australia were in a real bad patch, and it seemed like united them. But I remember like I saw like footage of them playing ACDC and all this kind of stuff. You looked like you were having a sort of a great time behind closed doors, but were were, were producing magic on the field. Yeah, I look we're always at teams like okay, coach. We're looking to have a good time off the field. You know, like. I think that's extremely important to have have the opportunity to do that, uh, to and to do it well. Your your team needs to be really clear on where the edges are of that, you know. And you've got to trust a lot, and uh, you you know it you, when 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 there's trust throughout your whole organisation, when from the top down, from the chairman through to the 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 CEO, the coach, and in, in, in 14 and 15 with us, that sort of happened because, uh, you know, my first, uh, the first things I was doing once I got picked as Australian coach was having a stand-up blue almost with the chairman about two or three things, and that got us squared away and um, had to trust each other because we were able to talk to each other honestly. Same with the CEO, and that sort of flows through with with, uh, with everyone. All the successful Teams have got that, you know. Leinster, we had that. Uh, you know, the Tars, we had it when in that year. Everyone was very aligned, and and it it goes a long way to making everyone feel good. You know. Do you, do you think the media is changing the way coaches like you can operate and characters like you? Because you said earlier, like you know, like sometimes you have a calculated blow up. Sometimes you have these these moments. You encourage guys to enjoy themselves, but everything around professional sport the window is closing you know the, the the world is a much more unforgiving place now do you think it's do you think it's having forcing people like you to change you have to go away sometimes from what you want to do because of things like the media um look i can't i can only speak for myself there mate i, I don't I, I won't change you know who i am in that regard and that's not being defiant at all that's just not normal nature you know that you don't you don't change who you are to try to appease someone else. If you want to change, it's because you want to change. Right? And then, and you can see how you can become a better version of yourself, which I'm trying to do all the time anyway. And you know, you do, you get older, you get different positions. There's a, there's a, there's different things to do, you know. Uh, and I don't, media's just doing their thing. I, I think you've got to, if you've got a supportive um organization they'll always got your back and they trust you i mean it's pretty hard to do anything wrong like all the little bits and pieces like uh that you know that i've been pinched for over different times they're nothings really but if your organization stands up for you um then you're solid that's what happened and, that, and that's where i feel a lot of coaches get left a bit hung out to dry sometimes their own organizations don't stand up for them and if you don't have that trust, there's not much point in going on with the job anyway. Is that what happened to you in 2019? The organisation didn't stand up for you? Oh, I think it was. It had happened before then, you know. Like, uh, they, the, the, um, they put someone in between, you know, they put another guy in at level, they put in selectors, and that's one of the times where I, you know, I've said it before, you know, I should have said, no, I, I can't have this, right? And then accepted the consequences if they fired me. But I was, I let my emotion of wanting to try and win the World Cup after the last one, you know, getting so close. And the only pass mark was winning because you come second last time. So the only pass mark was winning for me. Uh, I was so desperate to do that. I, I didn't make the right call at that time. I should have uh, pushed back. And then, of course, I understand where I sit in that in that organisation. So, if that if the if my superiors then deemed that they wanted that and I couldn't perform my duty unless it was inside that framework, then I should I could have just accepted the consequences, but I didn't. So, I hold myself accountable in that in that environment for not sticking up for who I am normally. And it 
got what it deserved in the end. It's interesting that, that you said, obviously, the media um, hasn't pressured you to change, but your own kind of desire to win is probably the only time in this whole interview where you that it's affected your decision making because you're kind of quite, as you said, you're quite calculated, you're quite focused, but that desire to win made you make a wrong decision as opposed to finances, which a lot of people do and basically the media because the media shape people as coaches. I see it all the time and they're like, you can't do this, you can't do that. And you suddenly you go away from how you are, you stop the players going out, you change. But it's interesting that you're actually in a desire to win was the one that, that, that put you in a bad position. Yeah, yeah, it did. No, I think... Yeah, there was a lot. Obviously, there was so much going on. We had to deal with so many things over those last few years that were totally outside the realm of rugby, you know. So, to and and obviously, we've struggled with you know having been competitive regularly. So, to do to then go to World Cup, you've got to have everything going your way. You've got to have it all running, humming, the top down. Everyone's got to be linked in together. It's so hard to to get there and do it. So to, to be successful, you've got to have everything in a line, everyone pushing in the same direction because that's what gets you all the little wins along the way. And, and often the, the, all the little things that go against you in that um, same breath could be avoided if you're all on the same, you know, on the same wavelength. Is that the most disappointing thing when you're, you're in charge, as you said, and you're undermined or you're, you're not, not supported? Because... I, I, you know, in limited fashion, I, I've felt that sometimes. And especially, I think, now in the world where big business, anybody complains on social media. One complaint, two complaints, sounds like 200 complaints. Uh, you know, people are like, companies now distance themselves because everybody distances themselves. I, I, you know, and if you do get a vote of confidence, it's normally just before you get shot in the head out the back by the bins. It's a, it's a, it's a difficult... Is that, is that probably the most disappointing thing in professional sport where you sort of feel like you're on firm ground you look round, you find out you're in quicksand and nobody's there to throw you a life raft you know uh no n not in not in the way that you're painting it. it for me it's more uh a disappointment for myself in myself because i've got a all in the role i have which is the lead in saying coaching you're the leader right but you actually have people on top of you, which the leader doesn't usually do, right? So you've got to be, you've got to have that skill of managing upwards as well, not just down. And I've been good, really good at that. And I don't think I was as good at it in that, in, in that little passage there. So I wasn't able to shape those people above me well enough because they don't sort of understand what's needed. They haven't been in that situation. So they, they can't know, so I need to sh try to shape them, and I wasn't able to to do it effectively. So, yeah, that, that comes back on to me. Whereas in the past, I've always been able to do that, been able to shape the people, you know, who, and not not by being deceitful or anything, like, just by getting them more in line with how we want the team to be, and that that will be the overall success of the organisation if we all think like that. Yeah, and, and and I think that's more in that way. Was that the hardest part of your coaching career? Was that the hardest part of your 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 whole coaching career that 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 period? Oh no, mate, I don't. It's it it was difficult because we didn't achieve the goal we wanted to achieve. You know, I think considering everything that had happened in the the last the year before and the lead up with everything that happened with Israel and and all of that commotion, when we left to go to the World Cup. Like we, we went, we were supposed to go to a camp at Stanford, uh, which the union cut at the last minute. Um, so we ended up going to New Caledonia, but we, we went there because we wanted to get away from everything, you know, away from media and just have a bit of time to prep. Like we did in the 15 World Cup, we went to Notre Dame. When we left there, we were like, we were in a very good mental spot. You know, we, we got ourselves back from a, a difficult situation and um, and I felt like we could really launch ourselves and I think we just, there was too many, too much, because of what had happened the year before, there was just too many little things that, little things that happened along the way that take the edge off, that, that take you in a direction you don't want to go. Oh, yeah, I won't go into the details of them, but, and they all lead to things just not, falling into place and it's only the small margins as you see in games it's all small margins you know 
you look at some of the games there, the tiniest of margins can make all the difference. I mean, what I'm fascinated to know is when you know stuff isn't kind of right, like you said, they've put, brought people in above you. How do you how do you keep going when you know things aren't going well? Like someone like yourself, you know, when, when you know kind of the end is, is coming, because it takes a lot of soul and a lot of determination to do that, especially as we talked about with someone like yourself in a financial situation. Because if I was you and I'm not as mentally tough, I'd have got home, looked at myself in the mirror going, I don't fucking need this shit. I don't need I don't need it. I did what I I did. I've done my best and left it. But you but you didn't. And I think I remember texting you in Japan. And I think the way everything ended for you personally, knowing you was was really unfair. And I think you deserved a lot more because of what what you did. And I, I, I wanted to text you that because you you know, you, you do. And I think sometimes Eddie Jones told me it best when you're winning, your phone's fucking blowing up. When you lose, you get a text from your mum and maybe a missus. Maybe. But that, but that's the only that's the only time you get it, and I think sometimes in those situations you you can count your friends who were you know to be there for you, and I I think it was it was difficult. But how did you carry on? Oh, because I I wanted to you know go back to prove them wrong, you know, like get the team to achieve its goal, which was to win. And I, mate, the the feeling of World Cup in fifteen when we got to the final, and when we were out of it early, and then we got we were coming back like with fifteen minutes to go. We were we were the ones with all the momentum and only a score behind, and of course you know the class of Carter and and McCaw and that they 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 got the game in the end. But that feeling on the watching the other team get presented the trophy that's hard to take, right? I'm sure if you ask your your friends from England from last year they'll tell you, you know. So uh, you you make it you mark that spot in your in your future and you say, I want to get to that. Nothing's going to stop me. You, 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 you your self-efficacy there, your, your ability to say, I'm going to do this. It's, it's, it's tested and you've got to use everything you can not to make it fake, not just fake. Oh yeah, we're going to do it. And well, you, you put in the layers at the levels of work that will make you get there and you believe and you believe, you know, and, like I said, made fine margins. A few different things happen in the moment here, a moment there. Things can be very different, you know. So, uh, and that's in every game. So it's not just particular to us. Like that happens to. Well, I'm sure it happens to a lot of teams, you know. So, it, it just drives you because you're motivated by the outcome, and also the outcome for the people that you have put in the blood, sweat, and tears for you. All your players, all the players I've coached, whether they've had uh, whether they've liked me or not or whatever I always um, respect them for I wouldn't know them if it wasn't for footy right so I respect them by what they've done from their football not whether I like them as people or whatever it is uh, and that goes back to the players I played with you know when I Campo cops grief from the odd person here or there because he says stuff or whatever but that guy if it wasn't for footy I would never know him and when we needed someone on the field, he was the go-to. No one was complaining about getting, talking to him then. They all wanted him to get the ball and go and score. And that's the way it should reflect in life, you know, afterwards as well, because that's how I know that person. So otherwise I wouldn't know him at all. So same with the players. They put in, and they've been through a lot, that crew. The 2019, as my mind as they could be often, is they had to go through so much in the build-up like that they were not prepared for that that they just well, I wanted them to get something for it you know they did it in the end but me me leaving them posted doesn't help them get it either well maybe it would have I don't know but that's not the way I would have seen it so I pushed myself for as a leader you're not just a leader mate you you're the servant of the people you lead it's all, it's all about you and it's not about you at all. So you, you've got to always remember that, that you are a leader only to serve other people. Do you have someone to talk to about this stuff, that a go-to that, that, that gives you honesty? Because you, you, you've talked about confrontation with people, being able to have honest conversations, which I think is is becoming more and more rare in modern society and modern team sports. And one of my like my New Year's resolutions a couple of years ago was to have more difficult conversations. Do you have your mates? Do you have, is it your missus? Is it someone that you can get a rain check in and go, look, I said this 
and I think I did this. And for them to go, Michael, you're not, it's not right. You know, do you have anyone like that? Yeah, like obviously my, you know, my talk to my wife about everything. But uh, I've got a, I'd still have my close friends from school that I still, we're still best friends. You know, there's probably six or seven of us still all socialised together. Like from, that's probably a hundred years ago in our school. But, you know, and I know they'll tell it to me straight. If I'm, if I'm going the wrong direction, they'll say it. Or if they think it, they might not be right, but I know that they'll they'll bring that. And uh, and they've always been. And in my brother and you know um, my sister, you know, because they see things with a different set of eyes. They don't see them with the eyes that I'm seeing things with. So I know I'll always get uh, honesty from them. And yeah, pretty much that's it. You know, I've, I've never had that real sort of go-to person or mentors or I've always felt like I need to, I can resource it. I, I've got to do it myself or find, you know, sometimes if I felt like I had a problem inside the team with a player or something like that, I would actually go make an appointment with a psychiatrist or a psychologist and pretend I had the issue. So I could talk to them, uh, do that, and then take that and try and translate it back to the player, see what would help me with the player. Do things outside the box to try to solve problems or make things better, you know. Is there anything you kind of regret about what you've done as, as, a, as a coach? Because I, I think whenever you get a job, uh, for all the things we've talked about, the emotion, the intensity, the considered stuff, the sometimes joining people behind you to fight a, a common cause. There's always a few fireworks. And for some people, like I like look at my life, my life would be a lot easier if I wasn't as gobby, wasn't as outspoken. If I was being a, like a calm, sort of calm person, I probably would have been much more liked, much more respected, and probably maybe had a few more, a few more games, but I wouldn't have been me. And I think I know what your answer is, but do you... Do you think you would see us ever self-changing or are you just going to be you all the way through and you don't regret anything? No, I, no. There's always moments that you wish you would do something better, but not things that you wish you never did. I don't know, I think that, what would you do? Yeah, what would you have done better off the top of I your head? I think like definitely around 2018, what we were talking about, that moment for me was really crucial because that's that's been my life philosophy around never compromise, right, accept the consequences of decision, make decisions and accept the consequences of them. And uh, that, that was, like, that was a, probably the bell ringer for me of, of all the decisions. Um, and it's only going to do me, um, going to be a positive for me going forward because uh, I'm still very ambitious in that space and uh, I want to make sure I get the most from that. From, from being part of that. Um, but I oh, would have, no, mate, James, I never ever would have figured I was going to be here now where doing what I'm doing or having had done so far what what I've done and being so lucky in life and family. I'm never going to complain or worry about any regrets. I've got a great, you know, it's been, <clears throat> it's just been, I don't know, crazy, a lot of the stuff. But crazy in a good way, not in a bad way. What's next for Michael Checker? What do you want to do next? Um, so I think uh, I'll spend a... My, my ambition would still be to, to to find a way somehow to win the World Cup. But you can't go... You can't... Just because it didn't happen last time, I just can't throw that away, you know? So I'm not sure how... I'm sure I'm not one big for planning in that way. Things usually come to those who do the right thing. So just do the right thing over the next while. Um, learn a few new tricks, you know, and uh, uh, I've, I've, you know, I'm still obviously active in, in coaching in different things, a bit of league, a bit of union. There's going to be a, some interesting stuff with league towards the end of the year as well this year. So which would be amazing to go to that World Cup, you know. It'd be uh, first for me. I've been to Rugby World Cup, but obviously never to League World Cup. And I'm really glad I'll be in the north of England, which is a real hub of, of rugby league. And uh, and then yeah, I think see what happens after that, and see 
without, like I said, without trying to orchestrate it too much, just by trying to be the best I can, if I can achieve my goal. If you need a social secretary for the Lebanese team or anything else or something like a, you know, a breakdown guy, or I mean, they don't even have breakdowns in the league, uh, uh, a bad carrier, I'm unemployed at the moment. And, the, the, you know, everything I do is public facing. And we're not allowed to be out in public. So, I, you know me, I'm a good team man. <laughs> I'll certainly call. Oh, yeah, I bet you will. I'm still waiting for you to call. I'm still waiting for you to buy me a beer, let alone call me. Well, um, I can, you know. When you guys let us back in, well, I'll certainly buy you a beer. Don't worry. Perfect. Perfect. Listen, Michael, thank you so much for today. I'm sorry to keep you so long, but it was fascinating. I had so much more to talk to you about. I think everybody who who listens to this will, you know, will be blown away kind of by what, what you're like and the, and the different size to you. I really appreciate you giving up your time. No worries, mate. I've enjoyed it. Thank you. Well, everyone, listen, that's what a flanker, the podcast series too. Uh, I'm James Haskell. And I was talking to Michael Checker today. If you like the podcast, please share, please subscribe. Remember, we're a YouTube show uh, and you can pick us up at all your regular podcasting places. 